Do you believe today that God could shake your family? Do you believe today that God could shake a church? Do you believe today that God could transform a community? So when I ask you this morning, do you believe that prayer works? I mean, think with me today. Do you really believe that prayer works, that God hears your personal prayers and cares enough to respond? I think the majority of us here today, if we were pressed with that question, we would emphatically say, yes, I believe that in theory, theologically. Yes, we believe that. But here's the question I want to ask you today. Do our actions, do our prayers match what we say we believe? I believe the church, not just Hollywood Community Church, but the church in general talks a lot about prayer but we spend very little time praying. If you're like me, you want to pray. You know you should pray. You try to pray, but it's easy for us to get distracted. It's easy for us to get discouraged. It's easy for us who are believers to ask the question, Does prayer really work? Does it really work? I'm sure all of us here this morning have made pleas and made petitions to God that seemingly have gone unanswered. Maybe you prayed for a family member, a loved one to be healed, and you fervently cried out to God for that family member to be healed, and they didn't make it. Maybe, maybe you prayed for a new job, and you were just convinced that this was the job that God had for you, and, and God was going to give you this job, and you prayed, and you didn't get the job. Maybe you prayed for a relationship to be healed, and it broke apart. Maybe you've been praying for a wayward son or daughter to come home, to come back to the Lord, and he or she is still far away from God. Maybe you prayed for the Dolphins to make the playoffs. (laughs) Well, you know the rest of that story. Your prayer didn't get answered. And even though you would wholeheartedly say, yes, I believe God answers prayer, you're discouraged in your prayer life. And your faith was weakened. Conceptually, you believe that prayer works, but practically today, you're just a little bit jaded. You, you want to believe, but doubt seems to prevail. I want to encourage you today with the thought that you are not alone. It was the disciples who said in Luke 17, 5, Lord, increase our faith. It it was the very apostles, the the founders of our faith, who said, Lord, we we want to believe, but we're struggling with belief. I'm reminded of the man in the New Testament in Mark chapter 9, whose son was freed from demon possession, and and God asked him whether he believed, and his, his response is so much like my response Probably so much like your response. He said, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Do you ever feel that way? In your heart of hearts, you believe, but but there's just a sense of unbelief. Will God really do this? Am I going to invest time and emotional energy in prayer? And the exact same thing is going to happen as always. This morning, as as I begin this message, as we begin this new year, as we begin our theme for this year, I want to confess to you, as I've confessed to God this week, my unbelief. 
I admit, as, as one of your pastors, I admit today that I am in great need for the Holy Spirit of God to increase my faith. And like the disciples, I desperately need, I desperately want to learn to pray. I've been a believer for almost 50 years. I've been in ministry for 35 years. And I confess to you today that I I am just learning to pray. Our theme this year is pray believing. Tomorrow we begin 21 days of prayer and fasting. And I'm going to ask you to go on this journey with us. You you can decide how you do it. You might sit back and say, Brian, are you telling me I can't eat for 21 days? No, I'm not telling you anything. All right? I'm asking you to be led by the Holy Spirit of God. If you sit back and say, okay, I'm going to fast one meal a day. That's what God lays on your heart. I encourage you to do that. If you sit back and say, I'm going to fast one day a week, I would encourage you to do that. If you sit back and say, okay, I'm going to fast from social media. I'm going to fast from this or that. I encourage you to do that. I encourage you to be led by God, to be led by the Holy Spirit. But I'm going to challenge you to join me and join our leadership for the next 21 days as we seek God, as we seek for God to make himself known, to speak to us, to demonstrate his power in our midst in a way that maybe he has never done it before. So we want to ask the Holy Spirit to eliminate distractions. We want to ask the Holy Spirit to tear down idols. We want to ask the Holy Spirit to make our hearts ready to hear from God. You see, this year, let me speak for myself and I trust for you. This year, I long to see God demonstrate his power in a way that is fresh, in a way that is new, in a way that transforms lives, in a way that transforms our church, and in a way that transforms our community. Church, God is not dead. He's alive. He's alive in your heart and in mine. And he desires to demonstrate his power, his goodness in our lives and through our lives. So as we begin this journey, would you pray with me today? Let's pray together. Or today we begin this year, the first Sunday of the year, meeting together as your family. I'm so encouraged by those of our church family that are here today. Lord, Lord, I pray that you would help us to sense your presence. Help us to sense your power in a palpable way in our lives. Help us to realize that you are real. You're not just a God who is far off, who uh, probably will hear our prayers. But you're a God who is close. You're a God who is right beside us. You're a God who longs to hear from us. A God who longs to uh, empower us towards a victory. A God who longs to use us to make a difference in our homes, in our church, and in our community. So God, as we begin this journey, I pray that you would speak to our hearts powerfully. And I pray that we would have ears to hear. I pray that we would have a heart to listen we thank you, we thank you for what you're going to do in our midst. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Take your Bibles and turn to me with Mark ch- to Mark chapter 11. While you turn, let me just tell you a personal experience that 
that I had this week. And so, I, as I mentioned, I'm I'm on this journey learning to pray like you. So we've had, as, as many of you know, our daughter Amber. We have a severely disabled daughter who um, is has cerebral palsy, and as a result, has so many physical ailments. In the last four months, she's fractured both of her hips, her right hip, and then her left hip, or was it her left hip, and then her right hip, right hip, and then her left hip, and Amber's still in the process of recovery, and it's been, it's been difficult, and so on, on Wednesday, I'm, I've been studying about prayer, and wanting to make prayer real to me, and, and I got home, and Vicki had a tough day taking care of Amber, and I said, you just take off, and, and I'll stay home with Amber, and so Amber was in her, her wheelchair, and As is her case, she gets uncomfortable every 10 or 15 minutes, and she got really uncomfortable, and I said, okay, let me push you back to your room and put you back in your bed. She's got a hospital bed, and I I pushed her back in her room, and I thought, well, let me just reposition her for a second, so I repositioned her for a second, and then I said, Amber, let's just pray together. I have to confess, I I haven't prayed a lot with Amber. She has the mental capabilities of a two- or three-month-old baby, and so that's not something that we've done a lot with her, but I said, Amber, let's just pray together. So I grabbed Amber's hands, and in a very real conversational way, I began to pray for the Lord and to the Lord and asking Him to, to comfort Amber and for, for Him to, to make His presence known to her, for her to sense His presence. And I made some statement in my prayer, Lord, I, I'm grateful that you're here with us right now. And at that moment, I, I'm not a mystical guy. You guys know me. I'm not some wild supernatural guy. But at that moment, Amber... Just and, and she's not, she's blind, she can't see, but at that moment, she just swiftly turns and she looks to her left. And it was like she was looking at something or looking at someone. And, and, and I looked at her and I said, Amber, do, do you see him? Obviously, we know that Jesus is always with us, but we don't see him. And I I said, Amber, do you see him? And I asked her that question twice. And this huge smile comes over Amber's face. And Amber, Amber, Amber begins to, to giggle and just to laugh. And it was, it was short lived. And Amber has a lot of responses, so I'm, I'm not 100% sure what Amber was experiencing that day, but I believe in my heart that God ministers to my daughter in a way that I can't. And, and, and here's what God taught me before we jump into the passage. Here's what God taught me. In our prayer lives, we have a tendency to pray to God as if he was a long ways away as if we were somewhat disconnected from him. If we could ever come to the place that we realize that God is right here. He's here. He's close. And he desires for us to sense his presence. And he desires for us to feel his power. So when we talk about prayer today and for the next few weeks, I'm not just talking about words that you say and and repetitions that you repeat. I'm talking about you developing, developing a conversation with a God who is real, a God who is with you, a God who desires for you to sense his presence in your life. A God who wants you and I to pray, truly believing that God can and will answer our prayers. So we're in Mark chapter 11, beginning in verse 12, and we'll bounce around just a little bit. Mark chapter 11, beginning in verse 12. It says, on the following day when they came from Bethany... He was hungry. Let me just put this in context. So here in Mark chapter 11, this is, this is Holy Week. This is the week before Jesus is crucified. 
and the week before he dies and rise again. On Monday, he made the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. You know the story. The crowds received him. They put down their, their coats and palm branches and cried, Hosanna, Hosanna to the Lord, the son of David. That was on Monday. On Tuesday, Jesus wakes up in Bethany, which is, was on the other side of the Kidron Valley. He wakes up in Bethany, and he begins to journey back to Jerusalem. And as he journeys back to Jerusalem, the text says that he became hungry. That's such an important point because we often talk about the incarnation of Christ. And we know that he was 100% God, but we need to realize that he was 100% man as well. And in his manhood, he experienced all of the things that you and I experience. And so as Jesus was walking from Bethany to back to Jerusalem, he became hungry, the text says. Notice verse 13, and seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. So, so, so here's what, he's walking towards Jerusalem from Bethany, he sees a fig tree, and all of a sudden he has a hankering for figs. You know what the word hankering means? All right, he had this desire, all of a sudden, he was hungry for figs. You know, it's like walking down the aisle at Publix and seeing Fig Newtons, and all of a sudden realizing, I haven't had Fig Newtons in a while, I want Fig Newtons, all right? So, so as he was walking, he sees this fig tree in leaf, and all of a sudden, he, he realizes, I would like to have some figs. That's Brian's commentary on the passage, okay? Notice, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season of figs. Now, this might seem confusing, but let me just explain something about fig trees and figs that if you don't get it, it makes the story a little difficult for us to, to understand. Most trees, and I don't know a lot about horticulture, and so please please don't correct me necessarily at the end of the service, but, 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 but I believe with a lot of trees that they produce their leaves first, and then the fruit follows the leaves, all right? Am I basically right? Am I basically right? You're following me, right, for the most part? All right. Leaves, then fruit. But a fig tree is different. A fig tree produces fruit, and then the leaves follow the fruit. And so in most trees, you might see a tree with leaves, but you don't know that there's fruit on it, all right? But when you see a fig tree in leaf, that generally indicates that there's what? There are figs there. But what was taking place was that this fig tree blossomed out of season because it wasn't necessarily in season. And so Jesus sees this fig tree that's in leaf, thinks that there's going to be figs on it. His mouth begins to water, walks toward the tree and realizes what? No figs. You ever been hungry for something and you went to the refrigerator thinking it was there and you opened up the refrigerator and it's not there and then it's like, oh no, now what do I do? All right. So I go to the grocery store and buy it, but there's a, there's a sense of disappointment there. So Jesus goes to this tree, no fix. So Jesus looks at the tree and he says this, may no one ever eat from you again. <laughs> Can you imagine? I mean, the disciples are sitting here thinking, what was that all about? Man, he must have really been hungry. He looks at the tree and he pronounces this declaration to the tree, may no one eat from you again. And then they just keep walking and they go to Jerusalem. I'm sure it was something the disciples later on thought, man, that was kind of a, an odd way for Jesus to respond or whatever. So they go to Jerusalem. The next day, they're once again in Bethany. Jump down with me to verse 20. And they passed by in the morning of the next day. So this is Wednesday morning of crucifixion week. And they passed by in the morning, and they saw, notice, the fig tree, how? Withered to its roots. Now, they had just passed that fig tree yesterday, and that fig tree was what? It was leafy. It looked like it was in bloom. This tree was alive. The next day, 
they walked past the same tree. And it says it was withered to its roots. That, that phrase describes complete devastation. It, it's not that the leaves had fallen off and here was a live tree with just the leaves that were falling off. It's not like a tree you look at when you live up north and in the fall all the leaves fall off of it. No, it's not that this tree had just begun to die. This tree was completely dead. Leaves, branches, trunk, and roots. It says it was withered to the roots. I love, Peter is always the first one to talk. So what does Peter say? Verse 21, and Peter remembered what had taken place the previous day. And Peter said to him, said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the tree that you cursed has withered. Can you imagine the sense of astonishment with the disciples? I mean, they knew Jesus was the Son of God. I mean, they'd begun to see him do miracles, but all of a sudden, they had seen that tree, seen that tree in full bloom and full blossom the day before, and now the tree was completely dead all the way down to the roots. And Peter says, Rabbi, Master, Teacher, oh my word, look at that tree that you cursed. And then Jesus responds. I spent a lot of time thinking and praying through this passage this last week. And so Jesus' response is surprising to me. Jesus responds in verse 22, and he says this, Have faith in God. They had just seen Jesus do something that was not natural. <laughs> They had just seen Jesus do something and the result of it that was supernatural. They cried out in astonishment. And Jesus' reply to them very simply was this, have faith in God. There are two lessons, if you're following along in your outline, there's two important lessons that Jesus teaches in this passage. I want to hit the lessons, and then I want to dig in depth in the latter part of these verses. The first lesson is this. It is hypocritical to appear fruitful, but not produce fruit. Let me say that again. And that's, that's what Jesus is teaching, and if you flesh it out, most Bible scholars will tell you that in the context, that's exactly what he's teaching. It is hypocritical to appear fruitful and not produce fruits. The problem Jesus had with the fig tree was that it looked leafy. It looked healthy. It looked fertile. It had the look of producing fruit, but its look was deceiving. The tree wasn't what it appeared to be. In telling the story, Jesus is actually indicting the religiosity of the Jews. You see, the Jews had this religious system that seemed leafy. We didn't take the time to look at it, but in verses 15 through 19, Jesus actually enters into the temple. He sees all this business and everything that is going on, and he condemns it, and he cleanses the temple. And so Jesus is indicting the religious system of the Jews, telling them that they seemed leafy, that their system looked good on the outside. They had all of the traditions. They had all of the pomp. They had all of the, the things that they had done for years, for centuries. They'd done the same thing over and over and over again. And someone on the outside would look at Judaism, New Testament Judaism, and say, man, look at that system that is functioning the way that it should function. But Jesus says, no, it looks really good on the outside, but on the inside, it's dead. On the inside, it is not producing fruit. It was barren. So here's what I want you to catch, because this is really important. Their hypocrisy was an abomination to Jesus. So much so that Jesus, when he sees the hypocrisy of the fig tree, what does he do? He curses it. 
He condemns it. Some of his strongest words in the New Testament. He curses it and condemns it. Why? Because it was hypocritical. It wasn't what it appeared to be. You see, to Jesus, appearances are not what are really important. To God and to Jesus, it's not how we look on the outside but rather it's how we look on the inside. You see, even though Jesus was specifically talking to the Jews, the Jewish religious system, that truth applies to us as well. Because you and I can look fruitful without actually being fruitful. We can look like we have our act together. We can look like we're following the Lord. We can look like we know what we're doing. We know how to walk into church. We know how to dress. We know the language. We know what to say. We know how to act. We know the Christianese that we're supposed to talk through. We know all of that, and we can appear leafy. We can appear beautiful on the outside, but on the inside, be as dead as can be. And just as Jesus condemned the hypocrisy of the fig tree, and just as the hypocrisy of the Jews was an abomination to him, I would submit to you lovingly today that Jesus is just as turned off by our hypocrisy. So let me ask you today, how's your heart? Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. Is your heart fruitful? Are you producing the fruit of the Spirit? Does your life point others to Jesus? Are you fruitful or are you barren? You see, the first lesson that Jesus brings out is this. It's it's hypocritical to appear fruitful, but not produce There's a second lesson that Jesus conveys, and I believe it's the principal lesson in the passage. It's this, faith in God makes the impossible possible. Faith in God makes the impossible possible. When Peter cried out, Rabbi, look at the tree in astonishment, Jesus could have used that opportunity to teach about anything. He could have stopped for a second and said, Boy, let me talk to you about the omnipotence of God. Because that ain't nothing compared to what I can do. He could have done that, but he didn't do it. He could have taken the opportunity and talked about the sovereignty of God. He he could have talked about the fact that as King of kings and Lord of lords, not only do trees obey him, but the wind and the seas and kings and rulers and everyone obeys him. Because he is sovereign. He could have done that. But he didn't. He chooses to use this incident as a living parable to teach us about prayer. To teach us about the importance of trusting him. And that believing that through him All things are possible. You see, the power to make a living tree wither is nothing, nothing compared to the powerful, to to the power that is available to those who truly have faith in God. You see, this morning, catch this God is infinitely bigger than your biggest problem. At times we elevate our problems above God and we worry and fret and I'm guilty of that. We worry and fret and we act as if our problems were bigger than God. There is no problem in your life that is bigger than God. His unlimited bank has enough to meet your greatest need. His his infinite wisdom is wiser than your largest dilemma. His kingdom, it's much grander than your biggest dream. (laughs) I would say today that his grace is infinitely bigger than your biggest sin. 
You see, our problem many times as believers, and when I say our problem, I'm not talking about you, but I'm talking about me. My problem is not that God is not powerful enough. My problem that my view of God is not big enough. The way I view God, the way I trust God is not big enough. You see, quite frankly, the size of your faith depends upon how you view God. Catch that. Please let that sink into your mind and your heart. The, The size of your faith depends on how you view God. Do you serve a small God or do you serve a big God? Do you serve a God who can answer simple prayer requests, but the big ones are outside of the realm of his possibility? Or do you serve a God who actually can do the impossible? A.W. Tozer, in his book, The Knowledge of the Holy, said this. He said, a lower view of God is the cause of a hundred lesser evils among us. In other words, one one of our greatest downfalls, and we can talk about the fact that we are subservient to the world and the flesh and the devil, and that many times we're our own worst enemy, but he said many times the problem in our lives is we have such a small view of God that that, that, that impregnates, that it causes all kinds of other problems in our life. If we could only truly realize who God is, if we could see his power at work in our lives, if we could realize that he's not a long ways away like Brian thought, but he's there in the room like Amber thought, if we could only realize that, it would transform the way we pray. And if it transformed the way we pray, it would transform the way we live. And it would transform the way that we interact and impact our communities. Why would the world want to serve a God that is limited? Why would our unbelieving friends want to follow our God if we don't truly believe that he has the capability to accomplish his will, his plan, and his power in our lives? And so as the disciples astonishingly look at Jesus and says, wow, Rabbi, how did that happen? Jesus says, have faith in God. You see, faith in God, faith in him, faith in Jesus makes the impossible possible. So so we ask the question then, how how, how then, though, do we access this unlimited power of God? Is Is there a faucet that we go turn on and all of a sudden it becomes available to us? Is there, a, is there a debit card that we can go purchase that all of a sudden will have all of that on there and we can begin to charge? How is God's infinite power available to you and to me? And the answer very simply, and it's what he's teaching here in the passage, is through believing prayer. It is through not only praying, but it's through praying and believing as we So that leads to the second point in your outline if you're following along, that believing prayer is crucial to spiritual victory. I tried to find the most impacting word that I could, and crucial was the most impacting word. Believing prayer is crucial. It's important. It is significant. It's necessary to spiritual victory. And here, Jesus gives to Peter and his other disciples a poignant and clear teaching on the way that they should pray, and on the way that you and I should pray as well. So so continue reading the passage with me. So Peter sees the tree. Rabbi, look at the tree. Jesus responds, have faith in God. And Jesus continues, verse 23. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, And does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. 
And whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also is in heaven, who is in heaven, may forgive you of your trespasses. Notice, notice the words and the phrases of confidence that are found in these verses. In verse 23, he says, man, if you have faith that you can say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea. Moving mountains, once again, we read that, we don't understand the context. In a Jewish context, moving mountains was a popular Jewish, Jew, Jewish idiom. It was used to describe spiritual leaders who were able to accomplish the impossible. And during New Testament times, spiritual leaders whom God used in a powerful way were called mountain movers. That's what they were called. So Jesus is saying that if you believe by prayer that you, just as these mountain movers, are used of God by God in an extraordinary way, that you can have the same confidence. Notice he goes on and he says, does not doubt in his heart, but believes. Notice he says that when you do that, well, what? It will come to pass. It will be done for him. This phrase, the, this phrase especially stuck out to me. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe. Notice the tense of what he says. Believe that you what? That you will receive it. Is that what he says? He says what? Believe that you have received it. You haven't received it yet, but you're already believing it. You're already claiming it by faith. Jesus is saying that's the type of confidence with which you and I can pray. It's not a hope to. It's not a cross your fingers. It's not a, man, that would be really great if God can do that. God says when you ask, and there's a caveat there. We'll show it in the passage. But if you ask according to my will, you can ask what you want with confidence that it's already there. It's in the bank. It's already there. He says it will be Matthew chapter 21 is the parallel passage. Matthew says this, talking about the same incident. Or, or, or Matthew records Jesus saying this, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Now it reminds you that it's not faith in faith. It's not faith in you. It's not faith in what you say. It's not faith in what you declare. He already began it by saying, have faith in what? Have faith in God. Have faith in the omnipotent, almighty God who can wither a live tree down to its roots. Have faith in God. Those are powerful verses. It's really easy, though, to mess up the meaning. Let me explain what I mean. I want to put a couple of phrases here. I want to ask Brad to come up in just a second. Brad's going to help me illustrate something. But, but, but in your outline, I said this. Prayer, though, is not convincing God to do what you want, but you submitting yourself to what God wants. So I want to illustrate that because often, Brad, Brad can you come up here for just a second? So I want to illustrate that because often this is the way we pray, and this is the way that I often pray. So, so Brian's sitting in his office praying, all right? And I am, I am praying, I am reaching out, I'm reaching out to God. Doesn't Brad make a great illustration? So Brad is God is all I'm saying, all right? That's all I'm saying, all right? Brad, don't let this go to your head, all right? So, 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 so often, here's the way we pray, all right? So I sit back and think, okay, man, what do I want? God, I need a new job. And God, I want not just any job, God, but I want a job that pays $100,000 a year, all right? And so here's what we're doing. I'm, I'm pulling God towards me. 
thinking, okay, my job in prayer is to convince God of what I want. Going back, and we'll, we'll do another one, Brad. We'll play this game for a while, all right? And so, and so, God, hey, God, you see that pretty girl in the back row? Man, I'd really like her to go out with me. So, 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 God. <laughs> That's right. Uh, that's really the way God would respond right there. That's perfect right there. Yeah. Or, uh, or any, any list of things. And so we pray saying, okay, God, with the idea that my job is to convince God that this is what I want. And God, I need you to get it for me. Often that's what we pray. Failing to realize that that's not what prayer really is. So, 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 so prayer is not me pulling God towards me, me convincing God, God, this is what I need, this is what I want. Come on, God, you're my father, you gotta give it to me. But prayer, on the other hand, is God pulling me towards him. God, God, I want a new job. And God is saying, boy, I'll give you a new job, but here's what I really want. I want you to learn to depend upon me. And when you depend upon me, God, I'll give you, Brian, I'll give you a new job. Or, or, God, I really want that girl in the back row to like me. And God says, you know what, Brian? When you love me with all of your hearts, then I'll give you someone like that girl in the back row. Or God, God, make my wife do what, what I want her to do. <laughs> How many guys would pray that? All right. <laughs> God, make my wife do what I want her to do. And God says, you know, Brian, when you become like me and you love your wife as I love the church, then your wife will respond to you. Listen, church, catch this. Prayer is not us arm twisting, cajoling, trying to get God to do what we want. Remember last week we talked about Jeremiah 29, 13. God says, If you seek me with all of your hearts, you will find me. Prayer is not a means to an end. Catch this, church. The end is God. God is the end. And God will only give us what draws us closer to him. And helps us become like him. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Give Brad a hand. Doesn't he play a great God? Now just so you know, Brad's not even in charge at home. Kelly's in charge at home, right? So, so that doesn't go straight to his head. Prayer is not pulling God toward us. Prayer is us being pulled towards him. Jesus, Jesus gave us the greatest illustration of that. When Jesus was there in the Garden of Gethsemane, how did he pray? Remember what Jesus said? Not my will, but yours be done. There, there, there was this understanding of submission. Even when Jesus prayed, there was this understanding of submission. And that submission resulted in belief. And that belief allowed him to pray confidently. So I say this in your outline, submission and belief are the keys to answered prayer. Just some verses, Matthew 21, 22, and whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith, if you believe. John 14, 13, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. John 15, 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. John 16, 23, truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of me in my name, he will give it to you. I I want you to catch this. This is so important. So, So Jesus says that we must ask believing and we must ask in his name. So what does it mean to ask in Jesus' name? name. Is it a tagline that we put on the end of our prayers? So often it is. We pray through this whole thing and we say, and at the end, it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. And sometimes somebody will remind us, you didn't pray in Jesus' name. Oh, I'm sorry. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. It's not a tagline that you put on the end of your prayers. 
It's not a magical incantation that, that if you say these words, God the Father is obligated to give you whatever you want. That's not what Jesus is saying. No, to pray in Jesus' name, the name means that you pray according to his will. You are praying in accordance with his plans. You are praying in accordance with his purposes. You are praying in accordance with his kingdom. You, you, you are praying knowing that what you are praying for, he is in agreement with that. For example, let me illustrate. So every once in a while, we can't do it as much anymore with, with Amber the way it is, but, but Vicki and I like to go out to eat. And so if I say, oh, today I'm going to take her out to eat, and I'm going to surprise her, and I go home and say, okay, Vicki, I'm taking you out to eat. And she's like, oh, great, fantastic. Where are we going? And I say, we're going to go eat sushi. Because <laughs> I love sushi. And I do love sushi, by the way. Okay? She, she's going to look at me with a... She's going to say, if you want, that's where we'll go, if you want. She's not really excited about it. She's not going to go with enthusiasm, all right? But because she's wonderful, she's going to go, but that's not really what she wants, right? But if I look at her and say, hey, Vic, put the pots and pans away. We're going out to dinner tonight. Where are we going? We're going to Longhorn Steakhouse. I'm telling you, within 30 seconds, she's dressed, and she's at the door, and she's ready to go. Why is that? Because I'm, I'm asking her to do something that is in her name. She is in agreement with what I'm doing. And because she's in agreement with what I'm doing, man, she is ready to go. When, when, when God says, whatever you ask in Jesus' name. The idea is not that we magically say this at the end. God, I really want a brand new car, and please give it to me. In Jesus' name, amen. Or, or, or God, I, I, I need my, my husband to be, you know, to quit watching football all the time. All right? And I ask you that in Jesus' name. Boom, he's got to do it. That's not what it means. It means that you and I pray according to Jesus' will. And as Jesus prays and intercedes alongside of us, he can echo back to God the Father everything that we are saying because he is in complete agreement with what we are saying. We are praying in accord with his will. So you sit back and say, okay, Brian, man, how, how do I know that I'm praying according to God's will. That's so ambiguous, is it? How do I know that? Here's a few questions to ask. I didn't put these on your outline, but I'd encourage you to write them down. The first question is this. Am I being selfish? Am I being selfish? Am I asking for something selfishly? J J James tells us this in James chapter 4 and verse 3. He said, you ask, but you don't receive. Because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You say, Brown, what does that mean? Okay, the New Living Translation says it this way. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want, you want only what will give you pleasure. Examine your motives. Why is it that you are praying for that? Is there a selfish reason? Is there a personal reason? God says, if you're asking selfishly, you won't get it. Don't ask according to your passions. Secondly, does it violate God's word? Does it, am I asking God to do something that contradicts his word? God is not going to violate his word. It doesn't matter what you put on the end of your prayer. He will not violate his word. And so as I ask for something, i got to ask, God, is what I'm asking you, is it in accord with what you say in your word? Am I asking you to do anything that is contradictory to the word of God? If it is, don't ask it because you're not going to get it from God. Will it help or will it hinder my spiritual growth? That's such a great question. So, so, so maybe something isn't inherently wrong, but God in his omniscience knows that if I get that, it is going to hinder me in my relationship with God. 
Oh, God, and and please don't take this personal. I'm not talking to anybody. This is just an illustration off the cuff, all right? God, God, I really want a new boat. I want want a nice boat. And there's nothing wrong with having a boat. There's nothing wrong. But maybe God and his sovereignty knows you. And God knows that when you get that boat, all of a sudden, man, that boat's going to become priority number one. And God, his work, his church, is going to become priority number two or three or four. And God sits back and says, why am I going to give you something that will hinder your spiritual growth? And so does it hinder or does it help your spiritual growth? Does it advance the kingdom of God? What I'm asking for, does it advance the kingdom of God? Now, I know that there are so many different gray areas and there's so many different things. God doesn't specifically say in his word, this is the type of car that you should have and this is the type of job that you should have and this is where you should live and this is what you should do and and everything. No, no, no. God doesn't always do that. But there are principles that we go by as we pray to sit back and realize, am I praying according to God's will? Now, next week, I, I'm going to preach a message that, that God is really, really, really teaching me about, and it's hearing God's voice. How do we know when God speaks to us? How do we hear from God? You see, the simple truth is this. When I pray in a way that is not being selfish, it is in accordance with God's word, It will help me, it will help my family in our spiritual growth. It advances the kingdom of God. I can go with all authority to God and I can say, listen, here's what I'm asking you for. And I ask in faith, believing that you are going to do it. As a matter of fact, I ask you in faith, believing that it's already done. And we pray in submission to God's will. And we pray in faith asking and believing that God will do the impossible. The psalmist said this in Psalm 84 and verse 11, for the Lord God is a sun, a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. You see, when we pray in accordance with God's will, we can pray with complete and perfect confidence that God will answer our prayers. Let me just say a couple of things and I'm done. So what does that mean? What does that mean for you and me today? What does it mean? It means this. Through prayer, God's plan is available for you. God's plan for your life is available to you. God is not the author of confusion. God God takes no pleasure in us not knowing what his plans, what his purposes, what his will is. God takes no pleasure in that. As a matter of fact, just as you as a parent desire for your, kill, for your children to have security and all of that, God desires for you to have that. Psalm 37, 23, the steps of a good man are established by the Lord. Ephesians 5, 17, therefore don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. You might be sitting back today saying, oh, my word, Brian, I wish I knew what God wanted from me. So many people sit back. I said, people sit back and think, man, I would serve the Lord if I knew what God wanted me to do. Boy, boy, you know what? I would would lead my family if if I knew how God wanted me to do that, that. Ask him. Ask him. His plans are not a mystery. He doesn't want you to be confused and to not know that. Through prayer, God's provision is available to you. I love Matthew chapter 6. Don't be anxious saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all of these things. I love this phrase. Your heavenly Father knows you need them. So what do you do? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then God will add all of these things. You see, through prayer, God's provisions are available to us. Through prayer, God's power is available to you. Man, Brian, I've been struggling with sin. I've been struggling with an addiction. I've been struggling with anger. I've been struggling with pornography. I've been struggling with a bad attitude. I've been struggling with bitterness. And I just can't overcome it. You're right. 
You can't. But God's power can. James says, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. He flees from you because why? Because you have submitted yourself to God. So here's the question as we begin this 21-day journey. Here's the question. What is the impossible that you want to bring to God in prayer? What is it in your life that you desperately, that you earnestly, that you urgently, that you passionately need for God to do? And with as best you can, with a pure and a sincere heart, you want to come to God and say, God, please, God, I have this need. God, I have this situation. I have this relationship. I have whatever this is. God, I have this. God, I am asking by faith, believing, God, that you will do that in my life. What is in your life? What is the, the impossible in your life that if you had faith, that if you believed God could do it, that God would do it, that you would bring to the Lord in prayer. For the next 21 days, we want to seek God. And I'm excited because here's my prayer. My prayer is not that you're going to get, you know, 21 different prayer requests answered. I hope that happens. But my prayer is during this journey that you will seek God in a fresh and a new way. That God will become real to you. And you will realize that God is in the room with you. And he loves you. And he desires, he desires to answer your prayers. Would you take this journey with us? Would you journey with us? We're not going to tell you how to do it. Brad's going to come up in just a few minutes and tell you some tools that we're going to give you. Would you take this journey with us, and for the next 21 days, let's seek God with all of our heart, and let's see what God does in my life, in your life, in our lives, and in our congregation. But would you stand with me today? Jonas and the team's going to lead us in a worship song. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to make a commitment today. I've already asked many of our leaders this. Would you make a commitment to join with us? And say, so, okay, I, I am committing the next 21 days to seek God. We're not going to stipulate how you're going to do it. We're not going to follow up and give you a phone call tomorrow and ask if you've done it. Would you make a commitment saying, with God's help, with God's enablement, with God's grace, I'm going to seek God with all of my heart. And I'm going to ask God to do the impossible in my life. If you're committed to do that, would you just come with your spouse or by yourself and just take a few minutes at the altar and make that commitment to God. And let's go on this journey together. And by the way, three weeks from today, three weeks from today, we're going to celebrate in a way that we've never done before here at HCC. We're going to celebrate what God has done in your life and mine as we live and experience answered prayer. Would you make that commitment? Join us on this journey.